the promises of God for you and my life is yes and amen. amen. And we serve a God that will not change his mind. He will bless us as his word declares, amen. So praise with us. Here we go. Woo. Hey. You might as well dance and get happy right now. Yeah. Clap your hands. Move your feet. Hey.
I don't know about you, but I am blessed coming in and I am blessed going out. My Bible says I'm the head and I'm not the tail. I am above and I'm not beneath. So don't stop your praise yes, right there where you are. Amen. Our God is good. Are you ready? You want some more? <laughs> we praise you, oh God.
the final say. Take over at the final say. And say who has the final say. Take over at the final say. Jehovah turned my life around. He has turned. He has turned my life around. He makes a way. He makes a way. The final say, you say, Jehovah has the final say. Somebody say, who has the final say? Jehovah has the final say. And who has the final say? Jehovah has the final say. Shut it up, say, who has the final say? Jehovah has the final say. Jehovah turn.
I'm Pastor Nev, and welcome to Good Hope Christian Center. It's always a privilege to be together in the house of God and to be sharing the Word of God with you. The scripture is wonderful and amazing, and we're living in a time where God is speaking to men and women by their spirit. And I know each time as you join us that God is speaking to your heart, He's touching you in your heart, changing your life, and I want you to continue this journey with Pastor Wendy and I and all the great pastors on all of our campuses. And we have campuses all around the city in different parts of the world. And each time we gather together, I believe God has something to say to you. I was reading today in Genesis chapter 14. And Genesis 14 is a fascinating chapter because you'll find in it that Abraham armed his own household. What had taken place is Abraham travels and when he travels, he's traveling with Lot. And Lot is not really the individual with the best intention. Lot really is looking at Abraham and saying, I'll give you the worst land, I'll take the best land. And Lot's motivation is to live near Sodom and Gomorrah. He wants to live in the city where it's all happening. And at that point in time where he lives in the city where it's all happening, some enemy kings come in and they capture Lot and they capture his family. And Abraham then arms his own household. When he arms his own household and he arms his own servants, he has about 300 in his household. Many of you have individuals who are working in your household and in your companies. And I believe God is giving you divine strategies to be able to bless your staff during the season and to be able to ensure that God not only provides for you, but he provides for those that you employ and those you take care of and those you so graciously look after. And so when I see this passage of scripture, when you get down into Genesis chapter 14, round about verse 22, in verse 22, Abraham makes a declaration to the king of Sodom. And this is what he says to him. And Abraham said to the king of Sodom, I have raised my hand to the Lord God most high, possessor of heaven and earth. And I'm going to take something that I seldom do, but I'm going to just take my notes out of my own Bible and show you what I've written in my own Bible. I'm not going to put it up on the screen because you wouldn't see it, but I see these things. What I notice firstly is there is the meal of the covenant. You'll find that in verse 18 where they take communion together. Then you'll find there's the blessing of the covenant where God says, blessed be Abraham. And God speaks a blessing. And I want to tell you, God is speaking a blessing over your life and over your family and over your household. Let me go back into my own notes here. So you'll find there's the meal of the covenant, the blessing of the covenant, and then there was the protection of the covenant in verse 20. And it says, and blessed be God most high who has delivered your enemies into your hands. I want you to know that this is a season where God is delivering every enemy into the hands of those who love the Lord. Now, that doesn't mean we're going out looking for enemies, but every enemy, whether it's sickness, whether it's disease, disease, whatever it is. So we find these things. The first, we find the meal of the covenant, the blessing of the covenant, the protection of the covenant. Then we see the gift of the covenant and the provision of the covenant. And the gift of the covenant, you'll find the gift of the covenant is in verse 19 and 20, where firstly he says, Blessed be God most high has delivered your enemies into his hands. And it says, And Abraham gave Melchizedek, who is the priest of the most high, a tenth of all. In other words, Abraham, after having won this great victory, all the finance and everything he'd recaptured technically belonged to Abraham. And Abraham had liberated the people. He brought them out of captivity. He'd returned them back into their homes and wherever they are. Using his own household, he stood up as one man with his own household to defeat an enemy, five enemy kings, actually, who came against Lot and the family. And because they touched one of his family members, and I want you to know, when the enemy touches one of your family members, God comes to your defense. When we take communion together, God 
God comes to your defense. When you're given to the kingdom of God, God comes to your defense. And I also want you to realize that when you know who your provider is, that there is protection in the covenant and there is provision. And that's why Abraham said in verse 22, he said, I've lifted my hand to God most high, the possessor of heaven and earth, and I will not take a thread or a shoe latchet, and I will not take anything from you that is yours, lest you should say, I have made Abraham rich. I want you to know that there is no one who can make you rich other than God most high. The God of heaven, the Bible says the silver and gold is his. Everything on earth, whether it is the birds in the air that he feeds, feeds, whatever it is, it belongs to God most high. And Abraham recognized something. If you surrender, lift your hands up and say, the bank will supply my need. The government will supply my need. Someone will supply my need. You will be disappointed. But when you lift your hand to God most high, and you say, you know what, I'm going to honor the Lord with my substance. I'm going to remember the house of the Lord. And what a privilege it is for us as the house of the Lord to be ensuring that every single person that is part of Good Hope Christian Center is taken care of to ensure that there's food on their tables, to ensure that your lights and your electricity are not turned off. And I need to remind you that when you're part of this wonderful church, we love one another. We take care of one another. We bless one another. And the Bible says, first, the household of faith. Now, that doesn't mean we ignore the poor. doesn't mean we ignore others. This past weekend, we were able to go out and take care of an entire group of people in the neighborhood. And I want to thank one of our life group leaders who went out and cooked hamburgers and provided for people in one of the poorest of poor areas in our city. But let me tell you, if God can send ravens to feed the prophet and God can take care of Abraham and God can multiply the loaves and fishes as you give to the Lord, God will take care of you and the resurgent of your business and your family and give you creative ideas, give you inspiring ideas and be able to know that there is a God. Lift your hands right where you are. Say, Father, I've lifted my hands to you. You are God most high. I'm not looking to the arm of flesh. I'm not looking for men to help me. I have lifted my hands to God most high. And when I lift my hands to Him, not only is it an act of surrender, I'm not standing with my hand out. I'm standing with my hand up. And God says, you know what? I'll grab your hand and I will provide for you according to my riches and glory. He doesn't provide for us according to our poverty. It says, my God shall supply all of your need according to His riches in glory by Christ Jesus. So I want you to join me wherever you are. And you can go to ghcc.tv to be able to give online. You're able as well. And we continue to broadcast each day. Please join us. Join us for communion and all the wonderful things we're doing. But you can go to ghcc.tv. And as you go onto our website, you're able to give online. Send your prayer requests in as well because we're praying for each and every single one of you. No one is unimportant at this point in time. No one has ever been unimportant. God values you. I value you. Pastor Wendy and I and the pastors of this great church, we love you. And we want to thank you for being such a blessing in the house of the Lord. Now, once you go ahead and take the finance you're going to bring to the Lord or what you're planning to give to the Lord or write it down, lay your hands on it. And I'm going to stretch my hands out towards this camera and I want you to agree with me for a supernatural miracle of multiplication as we lift our hands to God most high. Father, we lift our hands to you. You are the possessor of heaven and earth. You said you will bless the work of our hands. 
And as we lift our hands to you first, and we give to you first, so you meet and you supply each and every need in every home. We declare there will not be one sick or feeble amongst us. We declare that there will not be one amongst us who goes bankrupt. We declare that new businesses will be raised up. We declare that this is a supernatural time where you declared in your word that the wealth of the sinner is laid up for the just. Abraham went and took it back. But even when he took it back, he said, I'm not looking at what the world can give me, but I'm looking to God most high. Now, Father, bless your people as they give. Prosper them in everything they do. In Jesus' mighty and wonderful name, and the people of God said, Amen. Come on, there was power in your worship. There was power in your praise. When you start to lift up the name of Jesus and when you put your thoughts on Him, the atmosphere in your home will change. So right there we want just worship Him. Lift your hands to Him. Say something. Do something. Because worship and worry cannot be in the same room.
hands of God for your love. Oh, let our light shine right there where we find ourselves, oh God. Let our light shine, oh God, for you. So revival can come into our city. So revival can come into our families. So revival can come into our household. Lead us with your love, oh God. Lead us with your love. I'm Pastor Nev, and today what a wonderful privilege to be able to share the Word of God with you. I'm always fascinated in the Scripture to see the process of Scripture, and I'm going to be talking to you today about the fire of the presence of God. As a child, fire, I think, fascinates every single child, and as a child, my grandmother used to not give me matches to play with, but what she would do is she'd take a needle and thread and give me a whole lot of buttons and tell me to sew them onto material because she was a seamstress and a dressmaker and and so she'd give me all these buttons and I'd take buttons together with the cotton and the needle and threading the needle and then would stitch all the buttons onto a piece of cloth and then take them off. But it was during this process of time while I was doing that that there were matches in the room and I decided one day to set a bit of the fabric on fire to, because I'd seen that you could burn off the thread, the, the threads that extend, you could take them off with a little bit of fire and it kind of brings the thread down. And so I lit a match and set some of the fabric on fire. Fortunately, I didn't burn the house down. Uh, I was able to put the fire out. But like any child, I became fascinated with fire, which is not a good thing. I'm not encouraging anybody to go out and tell your children a lot of fire. But that was one of my first experiences where I needed to put the fire out and I put it out. But as you grow, you discover that fire has wonderful benefits of warmth and a blessing and of increase. And when you get through to the New Testament, one of the greatest things that we see that is prophesied of Jesus, that he will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. When you go through to the book of John, chapter 1, verse 1, and I want you to go, if you have your Bibles with you or your iPads or whatever device, I want to speak to you briefly about the fire of God. And the fire of God speaks about a passion. It speaks about that which is consuming. It takes fire to bring out pure, refined gold. And so in times of trouble and persecution and opposition, we might wonder what is going on. Is God trying to destroy us? No, absolutely not. What God's purpose is to bring the best out of you and I. So in John 1 verse 1, it says, in the beginning was the Word, which is very similar to Genesis chapter 1, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him and through him, and without him was nothing made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in darkness, and the darkness could not comprehend it, or the darkness could not shut the light down. 
It's later in Scripture where we are told, you are the light of the world. In fact, we're told in Matthew, we are light, we are salt, and we give the earth a sense of light. Now, when you begin to look at light, obviously I was talking to you about fire. Well, fire, of course, is combustible, needs combustible materials. Fire appears in the Scripture, and it's always talked about in relationship to God manifesting himself in great power. And so we discover when we go back to the book of Genesis, the significance of fire was that after there was a sacrifice, the animal had to be burnt with fire. We've just come through this Passover season. And what transpired after Adam and Eve turned their lives over to satanic powers, God Make sure, firstly, that they're covered. Now, remember, they try to cover themselves with fig leaves, which is not a, a good idea. I'm sure it was uncomfortable. But God covers them, and Hebrew tradition tells us that God covered them with a lamb. Then we find Cain and Abel, and Cain brings a sacrifice to God, and that sacrifice would have been a lamb. Jesus comes, and the Bible says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the earth. But what we don't see with Jesus is fire. Because every sacrifice had to be burnt with fire. So when the Egyptians or when the Hebrew children come out of Egypt at Passover, which you read in the book of Exodus, and they've been persecuted and afflicted by Pharaoh. And we read in the scripture four times where we see Pharaoh hardens his heart. God hardens Pharaoh's heart. Pharaoh hardens his heart. God hardens Pharaoh's heart. And we look at that and we think God's an unjust God. No, God gave even Pharaoh an opportunity to get his life right with God. And so what transpires during this period of time, there's a point, and when we go back to the book of Genesis chapter 15, God is speaking to Abraham, prophesying a day when people will come out of the bondage of Egypt and be free. Now, we've seen before in Genesis 14, where Abraham said in Genesis 14, 22, I've lifted my hands to God most high, the possessor of heaven and earth. So the first thing we understand is that Abraham understands there is only one God and he alone shall be worshipped. And this God of heaven sends his only son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to die on the cross. Then Jesus, when you read the book of Acts chapter 1, and for those of you that have come through Passover, it's good to read chapter 1 and then to chapter 2, you'll find that many were raised from the grave. And I gave you that trivia question on uh, my communion thing where I said how many people were raised from the dead and find it in the scripture. Well, 500 came out of their graves when Jesus came out of his grave and they walked the streets of Jerusalem. Now, between the period of Jesus having gone back to heaven and Jesus meeting with his disciples in Acts chapter 1, where the disciples seen him taken up into heaven. It's during this period of time that I'm interested in because we are now past the resurrection and we're looking to where Jesus ascends into heaven. And he then tells his disciples, he told them before Passover to take communion, Then he said, I will eat and drink of this cup with you in the new covenant. Now let's go back. We looked at John chapter 1 where the Bible says he was the light of the world. Now God speaking to Abraham is giving him a prophetic word. And when God speaks to him, Abraham has made a sacrifice. So you'll find in Genesis chapter 15, after Abraham had lifted up his hands to God most high, it says, after these things, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision. In verse one, I believe God's word is coming to you today. He'll speak to your heart. First thing he says to him is, fear not, I am your shield and your exceeding great reward. And Abraham said, Lord God, what will you give me? Now, can you imagine God has appeared to you and speaks to you, and Abraham has the audacity to say, what 
will you give me? And this is what he asks, seeing I go childless, and I'm the steward of my house, is Eliezer of Damascus. Now, Abraham at this point in time and Sarah want to have a child. And of course, we know that they are childless. And we discover that the Bible tells us later in the book of Hebrews that by faith, Abraham and Sarah, Abraham changes his name from Abram to Abraham, the father of a great multitude, after God had spoken to him in Genesis chapter 14 and said, you're going to be the possessor. You've lifted your hands to God most high. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bless your seed. Abraham keeps pursuing God, and in pursuing him, he asks, what will you give me? Verse 7, God speaks to me, says, I am the Lord who brought you out of the earth of Chaldees, a heathen land, to give you this land to inherit it. I believe it's a time to inherit the land that we're on. And then Abraham asks a question in verse 18. He says, how do I know? I'll inherit it. I have no children. And he said, uh, and then notice God speaks to him and he said to him, Take a heifer of three years old and a she-goat of three years old and a ram of three years old and a turtle dove and a young pigeon. So God gives him a whole list of sacrifices that he needs to make. Abraham makes the sacrifices of these animals. And in making the sacrifice of these animals, now there are these dead carcasses lying everywhere. And while these dead carcasses are lying everywhere, the fowls and the birds of the air come to devour the carcasses. And it's amazing, whenever God gives you a promise, the devil wants to come and steal the promise of God. That's why the Bible talks about Jesus in John 1 verse 1 says, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. And we have to understand that first and foremost, God's word is a promise to you. And whatever promise God has given to you, he will keep his promise and he will not move away from what he has promised you. So here I notice that when Abraham, after he's given to Melchizedek, he's tithed, he now says, Lord, I am not just about what is on earth. I need a godly seed. I need to leave an inheritance to my children and my children's children. I need them to be blessed. But of course, he's childless and so is Sarah. And at this time, Abraham says, what I'm going to do is bring the sacrifice. And of course, he brings the sacrifice. In verse 12, it says, and when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abraham and the horror of darkness. And so everything he thought, now I've made this sacrifice and uh, he's in this place and then it goes on where God prophesies to him and this is the prophetic word he speaks to him this is long before the children of Israel are in captivity and I believe God is speaking to us prophetically he says in the fourth generation he's talking about what will happen to the people how they will go into captivity he says in the fourth generation in verse 16 uh, the, the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full, and it'll come to pass when the sun went down and it was dark, behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp passed between the pieces. In the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham. So during this period of time, God speaks to Abraham, and he says to him, I'm going to give you seed, I'm going to give you a family, but they will go into captivity. He's prophesying about Joseph's day. He's also prophesying that there will come a day when people will come out of Egypt and there will be a covenant, not only a covenant meal, but they'll come out through the blood, under the blood, and they'll move towards the promised land. Abraham has made all these sacrifices. He's killed all these animals and he's defending them from the birds of the air. But then the Bible says God showed up in person. And when God shows up in person, this is how he shows up. It says he showed up in verse um, 17, in verse 17, and then in verse 18, in verse 17 and 18. And it came to pass when the sun went down and it was dark that behold, there appeared 
a smoking oven. Now hold this, and we, we're going to hold this for a moment. A smoking oven and a burning torch, and passed between the pieces. So here Abraham sacrificed the animals. They chopped in half. Their blood has been shed. He has sacrificed every animal that he can sacrifice. Bearing in mind, Abraham is a wealthy man. And he's made these sacrifices because he has one plea in his heart. Sarah and I are childless. Give us a child. Give us a promise. Bless us. So at this point in time, when we find Abraham, he hasn't taken these sacrifices and done what the scripture would have done and told him to do is to light a fire and burn the entire sacrifice that none of the sacrifice should be left. He hasn't taken any of the sacrifice to eat from it. He's made an enormous sacrifice from what he has in terms of his personal wealth when you read about what he's given to the Lord. He's exhausted, he's tired, he feels he can't fight any longer. And then there's a point where God steps in. This is where we begin to talk about the fire of the sacrifice. And it came to pass when it was dark and the sun went down that behold there appeared a smoking oven and a burning torch that passed between the pieces. Notice verse 18. On the same day, God made a covenant with Abraham saying to your descendants. Now remember here his name is Abram, A-B-R-A-M. Later, it's changed to Abraham, the father of a great multitude. He's going to wait 25 years before the promise comes to pass. He's even going to try to help God out to bring the promise to pass by taking Sarah's maid or lady who worked for her and having a baby with her. And Hagar has a child called Ishmael. He's going to do what he can to help God out. And God looks at him and says, that's not the one. I promised you I would give you a gift. I would give you an inheritance. That gift was one son that was given to Abraham. Later on, we read that he's offered, asked to offer up Isaac again on an altar of sacrifice. He understood the altar. He understood that when you build an altar out of stone, put wood on it, you were then supposed to take the animals and burn them, and that fire would ascend into heaven, and it would say the sacrifice has been received. At Calvary, Jesus is the sacrifice, and we know that he has cried out at Calvary for our forgiveness. He's committed his spirit into the hands of God, but what we do not find at Calvary is any fire. So it's very much like Abraham in the Old Testament and even in this passage saying, here's the sacrifice, here's the altar, but where is the fire? And we discover that when God moves in and visits Abraham and he passes between the people, you see how God describes himself in verse 17 before he makes the covenant with Abraham. It says, a smoking oven. Do you remember the three Hebrew boys? You remember there was Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And remember the three Hebrew boys were thrown into the fiery furnace. And it was only when they were in the furnace that the emperor said, I see a fourth man walking in the furnace, and he looks like the Son of God. I have news for you. Sometimes when we think that we're in the furnace of oppression, and we're in the furnace of despair, and the furnace of sickness and disease, that God has left us. But it's in the furnace that gold is refined. It's in the furnace that God appears. It was in the furnace that God appeared to the three Hebrew boys. Then we notice in the book of John, Jesus says, when we walk in the light. And so what we read in the book of John, Jesus comes into the earth as the light of the world. Now, Calvary's over. Jesus has died. He's been raised from the dead. But there's no fire on the sacrifice until we get to Acts chapter 2. And when we get to Acts chapter 2, in Acts chapter 2 verse 1, it says, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come. Now let's look at where we are. The day of Pentecost was 50, the number 
50. So if we look at the day of Pentecost and we take Passover, or we take what we would call Easter, and we move 50 days from now, which is June, July, roughly around that period, we move into that period on the Gregorian calendar. It was a period where they would celebrate Pentecost. So if we looked at the Israeli feasts, and you may not be familiar with them, first you had Passover, the sacrifice of the Lamb, Jesus. Then you had Pentecost, which speaks of the outpouring of the Spirit of God. Then at the end of the year, September, around about our September, you had tabernacles where we're reminded that in the New Testament, Paul says, do you not know that you're the temple of the Holy Ghost and God dwells in you? The question is this, where did the fire move? And so we discover that proof of the resurrection of Jesus is that while the disciples are waiting in the upper room, the day of Pentecost comes. It is a feast day. It is a hard day. And it says when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And I want to encourage you, this is not a time to be divisive. This is not a time to be destructive. This is not a time to look at brother against brother. I was walking down the road with Pastor Wendy the other day, and we were simply walking to the store to get some groceries. We decided rather than drive, it's a short walk to the store, we would walk to the store and get some groceries and walk back. And so we had our shopping bags, and we went down to the local store and got the bags, and I've got kind of like a little trolley thing that I can pull behind me, great little trolley deal, and uh, that's on wheels, and I'm dragging it down there. But you know how it is when you go to the grocery store, you land up buying more than you should. So I took three little bags, and then suddenly realized I needed more. So the little trolley I had was could just carry a crate, simple crate, and maybe put two or three shopping bags in it. But because I put a bit of extra water in and a few heavier things. The bags were quite heavy. Yes, I could put it back on the trolley and wheel it back to the house. But I called a friend and said, I know you're nearby. Why don't you just pick this up, put it in the back of the car, and take it to the house, and Pastor Wendy and I will walk back. Well, we're walking back, and we're not doing anything illegal. We're keeping our distance. Uh, you know, that's real strange. We keep our distance, but we live in the same house, sleep in the same bed, love each other. Uh, be that as it may, but it's quite interesting now because if I'm the driver, I'm like a chauffeur and Pastor Wendy's in the back, and these are all good things. Do them. But here's something that's really interesting. We're walking back. And as we're walking back, suddenly a window in an apartment block flies open and a lady starts shouting at us and saying, you need to get inside. You can't be outside. Now, I understand that. We need to obey those that have the rule over us. Don't be spending as much time outside and running around the streets. I understand that. But we simply just walked to the store, got some milk, got some bread, the basic essentials, and we're coming back. It was a bit too heavy. And so I said to a friend who's in the same store but had a smaller vehicle, can you just take this back to the house, which they graciously did. Now we're walking back a very short distance, about one kilometer. We're walking back, and as we're walking back, this lady begins to shout, and out of the window, she begins to film Pastor Wendy and I. I said, you know what? I feel like we're living in the last days where neighbor reports on neighbor. And we started to laugh, and uh, it became a funny situation. And then at that point in time, just before we get to our house, the, the security guy came around and he said to us, are you okay? Were you walking to the store? Yes, we were. Did you buy groceries? Yes, we did. And he said, you know, this lady is reporting everybody in the neighborhood. And I began to laugh. I said, can you imagine what it was like on the day of Pentecost? They were hiding in the upper room because Jesus had been crucified. So the disciples are hiding. And what God has spoken to them and Jesus has said to them, I'm going to pour out my spirit. But here's what happens in the upper room. They're all together. They're all sitting together. There's about 120 of them sitting in the upper room. And while they're in this upper room, I'm not sure how far apart they were, but you'll notice if you keep reading the passage, it says, and suddenly there came from heaven the sound of a mighty rushing wind. And 
I believe that God is sending the sound of a mighty rushing wind that will not only destroy every infection and every virus, but the power of the Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit, like a mighty rushing wind, will flow into your life because you've lifted your hand to God Most High, the possessor of heaven and earth. Abraham had to make sacrifices. The children of Israel had to make sacrifices. Jesus is the sacrifice on the cross. But after the cross, we don't see any fire. Every sacrifice had to be burnt by fire till nothing was left on the altar because the Bible says our God is a consuming fire. He's passionate. He's powerful. He's overwhelming. But every fire needs breath and wind. So firstly, there comes the sound of a mighty rushing wind. And it filled the house where they were sitting. And I pray that right now, God will fill your house with the presence of the Spirit. That you'll breathe in of the life of the Spirit. Then the Bible says, and there appeared divided tongues of fire. Now, I told you what I did as a little child, lighting a fire. And right now, it's not a good idea. And I'm sure many of you identify that as children you messed about with fire, wasn't a good idea. But notice what God does. There appears on each individual divided tongues of fire. Now remember, Abraham in Genesis 15. Later on, there's Isaac. We remember the Passover lamb, where it had to be roasted with fire all the way from Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, all the way through to the book of Malachi, even in the days of Jesus, there were sacrifices, blood sacrifices, animals being sacrificed till Jesus, the Lamb of God, was sacrificed at Calvary. Since he was sacrificed at Calvary, there have been no further blood sacrifices in Jerusalem or in Israel. Because the Lamb of God died at Calvary. But where is the fire? The fire comes on the day of Pentecost to say the sacrifice has been. (laughs) I'm not sad. I'm just getting excited. I'm not sad in any way. But you notice this. It says the sacrifice has been received. Not just Jesus at Calvary. We don't just see the cross. We see beyond the cross. And when we look beyond the cross, we look at the power of the resurrected life. That's why Romans chapter 8, verse 26, 27, 28 says, and in fact, the whole of Romans talks about, and if the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he will quicken your mortal body. What kind of power was in the Spirit of God. The same that was in God himself. God appears as a fire. In Exodus 24, and we're not going to go there, when God appears to Moses, he appears as a fire. And when Moses receives the Ten Commandments, he comes down off the mountain, he's glowing, and people can't look at his face. The book of Corinthians says, if the glory on Moses, and the glory on the old covenant, and the glory on the sacrifice of the animals was glorious, how much more won't the glory? Now, you say, Pastor Nib, you're speaking religious language. Glory just means the value of a thing. Gold is glorious. Silver is glorious. When light captures it, it's glorious. Now the fire settles on people because what happened is God had shifted out of earth, out of human built tabernacles and moved into earthly tabernacles. He moved into you and I. And when Jesus moves into you and I, you are living with a God who is a consuming fire. The wind comes, then it says tongues of fire sat on them. Now, from what we understand, was it on their head? Well, that's what it appears to be. Multiple little flames on each and everyone's head. Then the Bible says, sat on them. And if you go on to verse 4, it says, and they were all 
filled with the Holy Spirit. Now it's clear the Holy Spirit draws us to Christ. But to be filled with the Spirit of God, firstly, there's the breath of God. Secondly, as you receive the Spirit of God, because you've offered yourself. Paul writes in the book of Romans, present yourselves a living sacrifice. When you present yourself, the work of your hands, your life, to God and to Jesus, you present yourself as a living sacrifice. See, God doesn't want dead sacrifices. He doesn't want corpses. What he wants is living people filled with his breath, filled with the fire and the passion of his love so that the glory, and the glory speaks of the excellence or the value of a thing, so that the glory of the love and the presence of God can be seen on you and I. And that's the most important thing. And as we're dealing with these difficult times and difficult situations, you will notice that this is the outpouring of the Spirit. And it says they were filled and they began to speak. Now let me address this very quickly and uh, I'm going to close. There's much debate when it comes to the gifts of the Spirit that are talked about in Corinthians. And we find that there are power gifts, uh, there's the working of miracles, there's faith, there's healing, there's miracles, there's tongues, the interpretation of tongues, uh, there's word of knowledge, word of wisdom, there are nine gifts of the Spirit, uh, but that's not what I wanted to focus on. When uh, you look at the gifts of the Spirit, the Bible says there are tongues, and in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and then 14, the last verse of chapter 13 says, now abide these three, faith, hope, and love. But the first verse of 1 Corinthians 14 says, pursue spiritual gifts. And then Paul goes on to address the church because he's seen in the church that people are speaking everywhere in a strange language. And he says, no one really understands your prayer language because when you pray in your prayer language, you're talking to God and you're not talking to men. So Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 14, he says, when you come together, it's better for people to speak in a language that everyone can understand. But bear in mind, Paul, on the road to Damascus, what happens? A bright light comes out of heaven, knocks him off his donkey. Then God sends a prophet to him and says, go and talk to this man. Now, the prophet says, I've heard what terrible things this man has done. And yet God says to him, this is all in the book of Acts, he says, go. For he is a chosen vessel to me. And I will show him, speaking of Paul, what great things he must suffer. So Paul is not there when there is an outpouring of the Spirit. Paul becomes a persecutor of the church. There are many persecutors of the church. Many persecutors of the church. I don't think I've turned on the media once in these last 18 or 21 days where I don't hear the church, 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 the church. And it seems like the blame is being placed on the church. I want you to know that you are the temple of the Holy Ghost, that as church, as the church, and members in particular, just like God chose Abraham and gave him a promise, and it was a generational promise, and Abraham sacrificed, and you've sacrificed, and God honored that sacrifice. Abraham's faith is still acknowledged today. The Passover is still acknowledged today. The life of Jesus is still acknowledged today. He is risen and sign of his resurrection. The greatest sign was the outpouring of the Spirit because it meant that the sacrifice, Jesus as the sacrifice, had been completely received in heaven. But the fire that was poured out on the day of Pentecost was not a fire that destroyed the sacrifice because Jesus, our sacrifice, had already given his life. Now, we joyfully lay down our lives and we follow Jesus and with the same fervor, the same fire. Remember, Jesus said, you're the light of the word. With the same passion 
as a fire that consumes everything, we share with our neighbors and friends. There is a God in heaven, and he alone shall be served. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for these precious men and women. And Lord, as we look throughout Scripture, it doesn't matter whether, where we look in the Word of God, whether we look in Exodus or in Deuteronomy, or whether we look in Kings or Jeremiah or Matthew, or even in the book of Hebrews, we discover that you are ever-present and that your presence lights up everything. Thank you that our passion for you will show that we'll let our light shine, we'll not hide the fact that we're filled with your presence, filled with your spirit. And we declare right now that you come into every home and touch them with your presence in Jesus' name. Now, as you've joined me, many of you say, Pastor Neb, my heart isn't right with Jesus. I'm not living for him. I had one gentleman once in the hospital who said to me, you know, Pastor Neb, you're going from one subject to I don't understand to another I don't understand. And I said to him, it's quite simple to understand. God loved you. He sent his son Jesus to die for you. The supreme sacrifice. He rose from the dead the third day. The tomb is empty. 500 people were raised with him. There's enough evidence to prove he rose from the dead. I said, but then, even beyond that, God poured out his spirit on a group of people in an upper room. Now bear in mind, Jesus leaves the earth and he leaves the gospel to be preached to 120 people in an upper room. And those 120 people, it was said to them, those who've turned the world upside down have come here also saying there is another king. What were they doing? They were saying political powers aren't king and authority. Presidents will come and go. They will. But the presence of Jesus will never move. There is another king. His name is Jesus. He has never been dethroned, will never be dethroned, and is coming again for his people. And as you join me today, say, you know, Pastor Nev, my heart isn't right with God. There are those of you who've never received Jesus. There are others who say, my heart isn't right with God. There's some that have wandered away from God, and during this season, in desperation, you've cried out to him, and you might not have felt that he returned immediately because he's been grieved and he's been hurt and he's a good and a loving and gentle heavenly father. And when a father gets grieved, there are many times that the father may withdraw, the spirit withdraws. But as you're able to say, my heavenly father, I come back to you. I surrender my life to you. Jesus, come into my heart and make me a new person. I want to pray with you right where you are. We're going to agree together that God invades not just your home, but you personally with his presence, that you know your sins are forgiven, and we're going to acknowledge him and confess him today. Won't you join me in prayer? Father, thank you for sending your one and only son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to die for us. Thank you, Jesus, that you bled and died for me, that you shed your blood so that I can have everlasting life. Now, I thank you today that my sin has been passed over and you hold it no longer in remembrance. I give myself and present myself to you as a living sacrifice. I'll live for you and I'll serve you all the days of my life. Amen. Now remember, it's not difficult to be a Christian. People make it very difficult. And I was with a dear friend a little earlier and you can watch it live online. Read your Bible and say your prayers. That's important. Read your Bible. Pray. And you say, well, Pastor Nev, I don't know how to pray. Then take the scripture and pray it back to God. 
So take any passage. You'll all know the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want him. Pray back, say, Father, you are my shepherd. Take a place of scripture that you understand. Pray that verse back to God. And as you pray that back to God, two things happen. Number one, God watches over his word to perform it. Number two, you change. But I'll give you a third thing. As you change, you change the lives of others. I'm Pastor Nev. God bless you. Now, Lord, bless and keep your people. Make your face shine upon them and give them peace. In Jesus' name, amen.